Have you seen the movie Minority Report? If you have, you will remember its chilling portrayal of a world where three psychics called precogs are able to predict future events. As a result, you can be arrested for the murder you're about to commit, and not just for the crimes you've already committed. They, whoever they are, know what you're going to do before you do it. This system of prediction is combined in the movie with a rather sinister, cyborg-like law enforcement mechanism. A universal identification system using retina scans that links to a giant database that remembers everything about you. So when you go into a store, the holographic greeter will chirp, Welcome back, Mr. Rosenzweig. Will you be looking for another pair of shoes today? They, too, know everything you've ever done in your life. You have a permanent record. The image is, in a word, horrifying. It portrays a world where everything about you is known and where your future actions can be predicted and anticipated with great accuracy. Fortunately, it's fiction, of course. But nobody is sure for how much longer. Today, we refer to this five o'clock shadow of information technology as the problem of big data. Every click you take in cyberspace can be tracked. Your cell phone broadcasts your geolocation, and all your purchases and phone calls are cataloged somewhere. Taken together, this information can be analyzed to paint a picture of you, one that increasingly others can see. It may define who you are and let users predict what you will do in the future. The result is a real loss of privacy. After all, the big problem with such data is the magnification of its effects by how pervasive it is. In an increasingly networked world, personal information is widely collected and widely available. As the storehouse of personal data has grown, so have governmental and commercial efforts to use the data for their own purposes. Commercial enterprises solicit new com customers with targeted ads. Governments use the data to identify and locate previously unknown terror suspects to find so-called clean skins who are not in any intelligence database. We have discovered we can link together individual bits of data to build a picture of a person that is more detailed than the individual parts. Think of a tile mosaic or a pointillist painting by the French post-impressionist Georges Seurat. Each bit of color by itself isn't much, but put them all together and you can see a complete picture. Clearly, big data offers all kinds of opportunities to those who have access to it. As the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology said, it allows us to find serendipitous connections of new information. Yet the new capability comes at a price. That is, it creates an irradical trove of information about us as individuals, making it increasingly difficult to safeguard our privacy. If the government collects data to build a picture of, let's say, a previously undetected terrorist threat, it can also, if it's so minded, use the same capability to build a picture of its political opponents. That navigable web of data poses threats in the free world, and perhaps even more so in authoritarian nations. In thinking about this capability and the opportunities and threats it presents, we sometimes talk out of both sides of our mouths. Early in the century, there was significant hype surrounding the government's launch of one such big data program known as Total Information Awareness. It was a research project of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, in the immediate aftermath 
of the September 11, 2001 terror attacks. DARPA's working premise was that advanced data analysis techniques could be used to search the information space of commercial and public sector data and identify threat signatures indicative of a terrorist threat. Because this would have given the government access to vast quantities of data about individuals, it was decried as the harbinger of Big Brother and eventually killed. Compare that public condemnation and the government's reflexive response with the subsequent almost universal criticism of the intelligence sector's inability to connect the dots prior to a subsequent terrorist plot. This was the plan of the young Nigerian, Umar Farouk Abdulmutallab, to detonate an explosive aboard a jumbo jetliner on an international flight bound for the United States on Christmas Day 2009. If you've forgotten, he was also known as the underwear bomber, and he subsequently was sentenced in a U.S. court to life in prison. In that instance, we were told, we did not perform enough data analysis. We failed to link national security agency intercepts to airline travel records and State Department reports. The conundrum arises because the analytic techniques of big data are fundamentally similar to those used by traditional law enforcement agencies. We use analytic algorithms to take a lead, a single piece of information as a starting point, and follow it to identify connections. This is what the police do on a daily basis. But in the big data system, computer systems operate on a much more vast set of data. And that data is much more readily subject to analysis and manipulation. As a result, the differences in degree between what the police used to do and what computer analysis can do today tend to become differences in kind. To put the issue in perspective, consider a partial listing of relevant databases that might be collected by the government or by a commercial enterprise and used to build a picture of you. Credit card purchases, telephone calls, criminal records, real estate purchases, travel itineraries, and so on. All of that information is available somewhere, and it's increasingly easy for others to access it, including those who are authorized and unauthorized to review your personal information. Even though most of us probably believe that our web serving habits and credit card records are private. The ability to collect and analyze vast quantities of data is a fundamental change caused by technological advances that, like King Canute's fabled tide, cannot be stopped or slowed. The phenomenon derives from two related and distinct trends, increases in computing power and decreases in data storage costs. Computer processor capacity today is 10 million times greater than in 1970. The power of this added processing capacity translates almost directly into processing speed. It's what drives Google information gathering and Walmart's global purchasing system. And there's no current expectation that chip capacity limits have been reached. Data storage costs, by contrast, have been decreasing at a logarithmic rate, almost identical in pace to the increases in chip capacity, but in the other direction. What this means is that while in 1984 it cost roughly $200 to store a megabyte of data, by 1999 that expense had sunk to 75 cents. Recently, you could buy 100 megabytes of data storage capacity for a penny, or you could purchase a 2 terabyte storage device for less than $100. A terabyte, by the way, is roughly 1 trillion bytes of data. That's a huge volume for storing simple alphanumeric information. Indeed, one can readily imagine petabyte or even exabyte sized personal storage devices. A petabyte is 1 million gigabytes. An exabyte is a billion gigabytes. 
Now, a few years ago, the entire internet accounted for roughly 500 exabytes of data. In a decade or less, that amount of storage capacity might be available to a small corporation or even your son in his bedroom. So just imagine what a large corporation or government can purchase and maintain. Here's a practical way of thinking about it. In 1984, you needed about $400,000 worth of storage capacity to capture a two gigabyte movie, which today you can stream on Netflix in about two hours, or maybe a bit less. So the story of technology requires us to answer this question. What happens when ever quicker processing power meets ever cheaper storage capacity? Here's how Samuel Palmisano put it in a speech in September 2011 when he was the CEO of IBM. We are all aware of the approximately 2 billion people now on the internet. This number is growing rapidly in every part of the world thanks to the explosion of mobile technology. But there are also upwards of a trillion interconnected and intelligent objects and organisms, what some call the Internet of Things. All of this is generating vast stores of information. It is estimated that there will be 44 times as much data and content coming over the next decade, reaching 35 zettabytes in 2020. A zettabyte is a massive amount of data. It is a one followed by 21 zeros. Put another way, it is roughly the entire corpus of human information created from the beginning of time until the year 2000. And now we produce that same amount of human data almost every month. Our law and policy thinking hasn't caught up with this new reality yet. Several years ago, Scott McNeely, who was then the CEO of Sun Microsystems, surveyed the state of available technology, which was about one one thousandth as powerful as today's data processing capacity, and said, privacy is dead. Get over it. He was describing the loss of public anonymity. That is, our dwindling capacity to act, whether physically or in cyberspace, without anyone having the technological capacity to permanently record and retain data about this activity for latter analysis. U.S. law has a phrase that describes this phenomenon. We call public anonymity practical obscurity. The idea is simple. Even though there are public records, in practice they can't be found. So your privacy is protected by a veil of obscurity. Derived from a 1989 Supreme Court case, Department of Justice versus the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, the origin of the phrase practical obscurity is instructive in illuminating the effects of such changes in technology. Back in the late 1980s, practically the dawn of time for personal computers, the Department of Justice went to great trouble to create a database with information about the criminal records of known offenders. Back then, these records were kept in disparate local, state, and federal databases. Arrest records might be held by a local police station, charging records by a county district attorney, and disposition and sentencing records by a state court. Federal records were still held by other law enforcement authorities, attorneys, and courts. All of these records were generally public and in theory available for inspection by the media and private citizens. But in practice, the information was so widely scattered that no crusading journalist or enterprising individual could incur the expense of finding it all and creating a comprehensive dossier on any individual. Each of us was, in a phrase, practically obscure. Only the federal government possessed the degree of need and adequacy of resources to undertake the task of creating the precursor of what is today the National Crime Information Center. At very great expense, the Department of Justice began to collect criminal records on a small number of criminals, 
mostly prominent mafia dons who were of national interest. The Reporters Committee case was a powerful expression of the strength of the idea of practical obscurity. A CBS News correspondent and the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, a First Amendment advocacy group, filed a Freedom of Information Act request asking federal prosecutors for the complete dossier or rap sheet on alleged mafia figures. Now, to me, their reasoning was persuasive. Since all of the information as filed around the country and retained in these disparate databases at the local, state, and federal level was originally public, and as public information, you think that collectively, in the form of the requested dossiers, it would clearly be subject to disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. But the Justice Department denied the FOIA request. And a unanimous Supreme Court whose jurists at the time ranged from the liberal Justice William Brennan to the very conservative Justice William Rehnquist, upheld that decision. The court found, quote, Plainly, there is a vast difference between the public records that might be found after a diligent search of courthouse files, county archives, and local police stations throughout the country, and a computerized summary located in a single clearinghouse of information. Because of that distinction, the justices concluded that privacy interests in maintaining the practical obscurity of rap sheet information will always be high. Alas, the court's confidence that obscurity will always be high has had a half-life of fewer than 20 years. Large data collection and aggregation companies with names like Experian and ChoicePoint began to harvest by hand public records from government databases. Paper records are now digitized, electric records downloaded. These data aggregation companies systematically compile birth records, credit and conviction records, real estate transactions and liens, bridal registries, and even kennel club records. One company, Axiom, estimates that it holds, on average, approximately 1,500 pieces of data on each and every adult American. Anyone with enough data and sufficient computing power can develop a detailed picture of virtually any identifiable individual. That picture might reveal your food preferences or your underwear size, might tell us something about your politics or your friend's politics. Indeed, political candidates for office these days have at their disposal some of the largest and most effective databases ever assembled. These having been formed by merging commercial data, like your magazine subscriptions, and your voting records to target individual voter preferences. The New Yorker magazine cartoonist Peter Steiner once depicted a dog seated at a computer and telling a fellow canine, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Today, it's been said that not only do they know that you're a dog, but they know your favorite leash color and whether or not you've been neutered. So what does all this mean in practice? And how does it work? Probably the best place to start is with the 9-11 attacks. Two of the terrorists made reservations on American Airlines Flight 77. Their names also were on a CIA watch list. But we didn't connect those two pieces of information. If we had, we could have identified their home addresses from the information they provided to the airlines. And by a simple cross-check, we would have discovered that three other individuals associated with those addresses, one of them named Mohammed Atta, had also made flight reservations on September 11th. And if we cross-checked the callback phone number that Ada gave the airline, we would have discovered that five other individuals had also provided the same phone number to reservation agents for purposes of com confirming their own flight reservations, again on September 11th. And wait for it, had we looked in one more place in the airline database, 
we would have discovered the name of yet one more individual who used the same frequent flyer number as had one of the men on the CIA watch list. And then if we branched out to public sources, we'd have found that two more individuals shared living arrangements. That is, they had the same address. Finally, the remaining six individuals associated with hijacking four commercial airplanes on that date and launching them like missiles into the World Trade Center in New York and into the Pentagon at Washington, D.C., as well as the lone misfire that went astray on the empty field in Pennsylvania, could have been identified through a routine review of the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Services records. That is, the INS's list of expired visa or illegal entry. One terrorist was on that list, and five others had public records of having lived with him or among each other. And all, of course, shared the common characteristic of making reservations on flights for the morning of September 11th. In short, as the Department of Defense Review Committee concluded, with just seven clicks of the mouse through existing databases, all 19 terrorists could have been identified and linked to one another. Two years later, the story of Raid Albania, a Jordanian who attempted to enter the United States at Chicago's Air, O'Hare Airport on June 14, 2003, provided another powerful illustration of how big data might be used. And this time, it was a success. In some ways, it shows how much had changed in very short order. Albania was probably a clean skin, a terrorist with no known record. He was carrying a valid business visa in his Jordanian passport. And outwardly, he appeared to be an unremarkable business traveler from the Middle East. Now, the Department of Homeland Security operates a sophisticated data analysis program called the Automated Targeting System, or ATS, to assess the comparative risks of arriving passengers. Homeland Security uses ATS to decide who to stop and talk to and who to let through easily. The system has become essential given the sheer volume of travelers to the United States. In a typical year, approximately 350 million people cross U.S. borders, and more than 85 million of them arrive by air. Since it's not practical to subject all of these travelers to intense scrutiny, some form of assessment and analysis must be used to make more rapid choices about how and when to conduct inspections. ATS is that system and ATS flagged Albania for heightened scrutiny. He was pulled over from the main line of entrance at Chicago's O'Hare Airport and individually questioned. During the interview, Albania's answers were inconsistent and evasive, so much so that the U.S. Customs and Border Protection officer who conducted the interview decided to deny his application for entry and ordered him returned to his point of origin. As a matter of routine, Albania's photograph and fingerprints were collected before he was sent on his way. Now, there the story might have ended. Customs and Border Protection officers reject entry applications daily for a host of reasons. But Albania proved to be an unusual case. More than a year later, in February 2005, a car filled with explosives rolled into a crowd of military and police recruits in the town of Hila, Iraq. More than 125 people died, the largest death toll for a single incident in Iraq up till that time. Suicide bomber's hand and forearm were found chained to the steering wheel of the exploded car. After U.S. forces took fingerprints from the hand, a match was found to Albania's in Chicago 20 months earlier. So now let's change our focus a bit from counterterrorism to the power of big data to reveal personal information and patterns. David McCandless is a data journalist, itself a new type of journalism. Recently, he created a chart based on a sophisticated computer program to scour the web and scrape bits of data from lots of sources. For obvious reasons, we call these web-crawling programs spiders. And McCandless's chart 
represented hundreds of thousands of data points displayed graphically. It represents an annual human activity, and it shows a large peak in the spring and another one toward the end of the year. So what is this activity? Why don't you take a guess? To give you a context, I'll tell you some things that it's not. For example, this is not the frequency with which we watch sporting events. Even though the college basketball March Madness and fall football seasons occur near the time that the activity peaks. It's also not greeting card buying, though the peaks are near Easter and Christmas. So what is it? What is a human activity that occurs most frequently in March and then again around the Thanksgiving Christmas holiday season in the United States? Ready? Here's the answer. Facebook breakup data. This is a graph about how love ends, at least among Facebook users. The big peaks are for spring break and the holidays. We even see small peaks on Mondays, since people usually break up on the weekend and then report it to their Facebook friends on Monday. This is pretty amazing stuff. It's really knowledge discovery, a pattern we would not see without big data. I find it kind of exciting. Or, from a different view, maybe kind of disturbing. And it's also why Facebook is worth billions of dollars. They're collecting information about you that you voluntarily provide, and they and others are using it to build a picture of who you are. That picture is worth money to them and to other people. Now, I don't know about you, but to me it sometimes seems a little spooky how accurate the ads are when I go online. Some of them really do seem to know what I'm thinking. Let's try another example. I have a little program on my computer called Collusion. You can run it on your own computer if you want. What the program does is simply watch you as you browse the web and then keep track of how your browsing habits are being collected. See, what you probably don't know is that when you go to a particular website, say Google, that website shares your visit with lots of other websites. It colludes with them, if you will, to build a better picture of who you are. A snapshot of my own web browsing activity shows a field of dots, each one representing a different website. If I hover over the dot that represents Google, I can see that Google shares my browsing history with more than 20 other websites. Some of those, like Facebook, are other sites I actually use. But several of them, like Hot Air and Daily Caller, are places I never go. And there are even some sites, like cornell.edu, that make me wonder. I really have no idea why they're connected to me. But there you go. This picture is a graphic example of how my personal web browsing history is being converted into information about me. So ask yourself this. Did you realize how much of your browsing history is public? Did you know that the places you go to actually broadcast that fact to other folks on the web. You can see how that, too, is a bit creepy. One final example, perhaps a prosaic one. Like me, you may well have an easy pass in your car, one of those electronic devices that allows you to pass quickly through the toll plaza on the highway. Instead of waiting to pay a cash toll, you pass through a drive through lane, your easy pass is electronically recorded, and your bank or credit account is automatically debited. When your balance gets low, the system pings your credit card and recharges the balance automatically. It's very simple, easy, and very convenient. It's also a tracking system. The Easy Pass contains a near permanent record of your car travels. In recent years, many have come to see this as a treasure trove for tracking. For the police, it tracks criminal suspects. For divorce lawyers, it tells a travel pattern for cheating husbands or wives. And that, it seems to me, gets a bit beyond creepy and into fairly intrusive 
and almost Stasi-like territory. So that's where we are today. Big data is all part of the big picture of our lives, pretty much whether we like it or not.